Okay, um, I'm going to call this meeting to order, and I just want to announce that um, this meeting is being audio video recording um, by Ruth McGrath for North Street Organization through Adam Cohen. Um, approval of the minutes of April 8th. Uh, move that we approve the minutes from April 8th. Second. All in favor. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce Lynn Wallace, who's the chair of the Housing Partnership for the City of Northampton, and welcome, Lynn. Thank you. And you know, Councilor, our Council President, Bill Dwight, City Councilor Marianne LaBarge from Ward 6, and Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7 is absent tonight. The tiny one. Yeah, you can barely see <laughs> And Audrey, thank you very much for being here also, and she is the Vice Chair of the Housing Partnership of City of Northampton. Now, I know Lynn and Audrey, you were going to be giving an update mm -hmm. on the Northampton Housing Needs Assessment and the Strategic Plan. Yes. So I'll leave it up to okay. both of you. Excellent. I will start. Um, I know last year that uh, then chair of the Housing Partnership, Gordon, came and gave a report out and gave out um, copies of the executive summary and went over it in great detail. Um, you may not have gotten copies of it. Um, so I'm just going to pull out some highlights to that just to kind of set some foundation. But I don't want to belabor it because you know, right. they talked, he's talked about it. So um, we had done this housing needs assessment um, with some funding that came from CPC. So we we're very happy to be able to get that money and do this. And it is really kind of driving the tasks that we are looking at. You know, as a group, and our taskmaster Peg keeping us on track to keep it going. Um, and then I'm going to outline some of the strategies, which is the second handout I gave you, and I'm going to kind of go through and talk a little bit about what we've done in the past year since we were before this this body, and what we're planning for the upcoming year. Um, so this assessment was done, and it looked at um, the needs around housing for the city of Northampton, and really what we focused on, the gaps, right? So there's some demographics. So you may or may not have read a guest column in last week's paper that talked about some of those things. Perfect timing, huh? Like how it was. It was perfect timing, you know. Um, so the population in Northampton has stayed relatively stable and flat over the last several years, but the number of households um, has increased and household size is decreasing. So that in and of itself kind of brings forward, you know, is there a discrepancy among the type of housing stock, stock that we have in the city um, and the units that are available? The population is also aging, so you need to look at what type of housing units need to be available for a population that's aging and maybe, you know, singles, couples versus large families, which I'm assuming back in the day that most of the housing stock was built for our other families. Um, one of the interesting things, because it's been in the headlines of what's happening over in Amherst, um, <coughs> is uh, only about half of our stock here is rental. You know, we're about half and half owner occupied. So from a housing unit perspective, that means that there's still room to grow, I think, in the rental market. Um, and housing prices have remained high. So hence why we get brought into this conversation so much is about affordability. And there is still an affordability gap in Northampton. And we talk about small A affordable and large A affordable. Um, large A affordable finance with state or federal funds somehow needs to be mandated, you know, that low income people are in there and that there's certain um, income limits uh, to keep people in there and the subsidy keeps going. And then there's small A affordable, which means can your teachers, can your firefighters, can your store clerks afford to live in the city? And those are the things that we really take to heart. You know, we want to look at both of them, but you want to keep people who grew up in Ham. You know, they may not be the no-hos, but the Hams, and that they want to actually stay here. Do you know how many firemen or women 
actually live in North Hampton? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, it's, I don't know either. It's you. not many. It's probably not it's many. Not yeah. many, and that also largely due to the fact. Well, when they um, started transferring into a different professional model, they actually the shifts are forty-eight hours long. So it allows people to travel greater distance. They just stay here for 48 hours, and then they go back to Hamden or, and so on and so forth. So the, it, it's, it has, that has had an impact. Not so much affordability. I mean, I think actually, I'm not sure about this, but I believe based on their salary range that they, they actually. Um, yeah, from, from a subsidized affordability. Yeah. Well, certainly from a, yeah. the big A yes. that you were talking about. Criteria, but even then, they're. I mean, they're even in the small A. They. I mean, I don't think they're priced out necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, although, and I think that's not true of teachers, and it's not true of other other prof mm -hmm. uh, municipal professionals. It might not be quite the same issue with the fire department and so on. Because I know I do have police officers that live on mm -hmm. my ward, and I do have some firemen who live on my ward. Probably a couple now, but the yeah. days. And you have a lot of retired firefighters. I was going to say, they probably were, and now they're no longer firefighters. And they're gone. Yeah. They yeah. get the younger crew, and they probably haven't been out of town. Yeah. <laughs> with this, with what you were talking about with the 48-hour shift. So, so there is an affordability gap. There is, we think, you know, based on the assessment that Karen did, you know, some, you know, what's available for our housing stock and what people are looking for and can afford, but there are some misalignments. So what we're going to do, we've been doing, and we're going to continue to do is kind of identify those things, and what do we do to try to lessen those misalignments. So are you talking stuff. like homes or apartments? Well, our job will not be to produce any of this housing, right. as you know, right. but what can we do, and when we get to the part about talking to, a, about a forum that we're going to do, which Audrey will speak a little bit about, it will start to talk about those specifics. Yeah. What I have found in my experience of doing housing for a few years now, that the market is swinging back to rental for most people. The, you know, owning a home as the American dream with what's happened over the last five years isn't necessarily achievable for anyone. And we shouldn't penalize people, right, who choose to say, I, I choose to rent. I don't have mm -hmm. the means. I don't have the desire. Mm -hmm. um, and what I wrote about in my guest column and what is becoming more and more prevalent, and I think Northampton is primed for are people who want to rent and they want to be downtown, they want to be in the hubbub of it. They like the bikes, they like to walk, they yeah. want to hop on the bus when the train comes, that's how, you know, that's yeah. how they'll get about. And Northampton, like, you know, other urban environments are going to need to deal with how you get housing for those people. Even your, your retirees yeah. who are downsizing on my ward. Yeah. That downsizing and they're looking for apartments, if not small condos. Yeah. And they, they want to be walking in the midst distance. Of it. They right. don't want to use the cars. Yep. It so makes sense. It makes I mean sustainable sense. It makes you know sense for that's what people want. Create mm -hmm. housing that people want and they might actually take it over. So um, definitely what we want to do. So any questions? Again, I know you've seen the executive summary, but before I jump ahead, anything that jumps out at you that I can answer a question no, on no, no, what we may have looked at? Yeah. Okay. So then I'm going to go to the second handout, which is an Excel um, spreadsheet looking table for you. Um, and those were the strategies okay, that came out of the assessment that we did. And I'm going to go through them, not point by point, because that's absolutely no fun. Um, but as I go through um, this table with you to, to talk about the tasks that we have and the strategies, I'm going to talk about what we've done in the last year by way of update, and then give you some focus on some ideas that we've come up with that we want to focus on for the upcoming year. So the first goal was to create new housing along a range of income levels, both ownership and rentals. And the organizational strategy that we are embracing fully right now is community education. So we want to get the community educated and engage them. So in the past year, um, we've had some interdepartmental as well as community collaborations at the Housing Partnership. We had John Height um, in for one meeting, and we talked about the Housing Authority and what was going on there, what you know, what his needs were, what his uh, challenges may be, to see how we could be supportive to him. 
Uh, we've had Wayne Fiden in once, I think. Right? Not twice? It was once, twice? Twice. Okay. I it was twice. Um, and we've talked about different things around planning. Um, he's doing a grant, you know, focused more on the downtown. We talked about that and the implications around housing. Um, we had the mayor in um, shortly after his inauguration, I believe, mm -hmm. and talked about the housing partnership. And again, what can we do to support um, the mayor? You know, he was taking on the, the task of running the city. Um, we had a great meeting with um, reps from the CPC, the housing. Uh, Bill Breitbart and Joe DeFazio came in mm -hmm. and you know talked about um, there's new language in the CPA. Um, statute that yes. allows you know the expansion of community housing mm -hmm. and um, you know we're very supportive of that obviously but to you know hear their thoughts about you know the housing projects got funded a while ago but it's been a while since they've been able to fund anything you know with a lot of zeros on it so you know, just get their feel for what's going on and how we can be supportive uh, with housing proposals that go before them we also had Judge Abrashkin and Pam Wells from the Springfield Housing Authority up. They have done some phenomenal work around tenant services. Um, with some state money, some federal money, with just some collaboration of getting things that are available for tenants around keeping their tenancy. Financial education, budgeting, um, literacy work. Uh, the Springfield Housing Authority is really doing some phenomenal work. So again, we wanted to just gather information and, and be as helpful um, as we can about that. Um, and then other collaborations, um, actually Peg and I just attended a DHCD planning session, training session, workshop day um, with a bunch of other planners and city reps um, out at Devon's, which I know you got a lot out of, um, as well as I did, but I know you were connecting with the new guy down in Holyoke and doing some real interesting work what's being and Wayne actually presented at it. We, you know, they're talking about what is in the toolbox to help communities deal with urban development, infill, you know, urban infill development, sustainability. It was actually a very good day. And there's some new things coming out from DACD. What we intend on doing um, in the upcoming year, more letters to the editor and guest columns, um, that's what came out last week, and try to do something quarterly either tackle a different topic, or if there's a project coming up, talk about our developer forum, really start to engage with the community and the work that the partnership is doing to get them to understand um, what's available for participation you know, for them if they're interested in this. Um, we also have upcoming folks from the, is it the Hampshire Council of Governments that are gonna talk about smoking policies? About what? Smoking and non-smoking policies oh. in multifamily units, which would be very mm -hmm. interesting. They should make them all non-smoking. I think they're really headed that way. Right? Yeah, because I mean, I do smoke periodically, but I think it's unfair if you're in an apartment dwelling, say like Walter Salvo's and places like that. Why can't you just come outside and go away from the building? I, to me, when you're in a big area like that with all those apartments, and I know what those apartments look like, and to me, you be able to smell that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the debate that's going on. So we want to educate ourselves so that we're right. as supportive to It'd be interesting to find out how many actually do smoke in these apartments. I'm sure can somebody's you, done that survey. Can I, can I ask yeah. you, as you, you're probably aware that there's currently um, some zoning amendments being mm -hmm. that, that are percolating that are relevant to what you're yep. describing. It's, it's increasing, allowing because existing zoning precludes uh, Half expanding. Of what we have yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the fact is, uh, many neighborhoods are actually non conforming as they stand yep. now. Um, it's, of course, a source of, uh, of, of contention. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I mean, part of your education would, you know, would probably go a long way to yep. making the connection for people what these zoning proposals are actually attempting to do is to facilitate an increase in affordable housing stock within proximity of uh, services. Um, and, and, and sometimes I don't get the sense that that connection's 
made all as clearly as we would like. I mean, I, I would prefer the debate function on that level as opposed <laughs> to the debate that goes spiraling off in other directions and other mm -hmm. issues that, that they're kind of off point ultimately. But I understand people's reaction when there's significant yeah. change in some cases that being proposed. So. Yeah, well, some of the things that came up, you know, for us as you get further into this, we're talking about regulatory issues and, you know, preserving <coughs> affordable housing, uh, uh, preserving tenancies. And, you know, what came out of our assessment was, you know, accessory apartments, you know, this particular yeah. zoning change to allow people to go back. They bought a two-family, they made it into a single family, now their kids are off again, you know, mm -hmm. allowing, can preserve affordable housing and can, you know, you know, eliminate but mitigate homelessness. Like if someone has a life issue that comes up and they can now convert third story, you know, to an apartment, if they yeah. can go back from a single family to a two family and that rent could help cover their mortgage. And I think it, you can begin to really frame the reality about what some of these zoning changes do, that it's not exclusive, but it actually is trying to make things more inclusive. And I mean, I don't want to totally speak for the partnership, but I am here to do that. Those are the types of things we're behind, you know, on what we can do, whether it's writing a guest column, whether it's at you know forums, whether we do more you know kind of public education where we get people to come and talk to us, I think that's great that. to do yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. You, there are maybe Bill, you might know where I'm talking about when Audrey was in Pegasus. When you come past Holyoke Hospital and you come down, there is a full blown light. We march by there all the time, and there's all these housing developments. Well, there's a there was They're a, beautiful. There was a private public, a public, private development by the same people who actually working in the hospital hill that's off to the right of that, at the base of the high school in Holyoke. You're talking about. The hospital. I think. Right? The hospital comes down and then there's, there's a Nick Boulevard and right. the high school's right there. And the the, the Churchill right, neighborhood. Yeah, the Churchill neighborhood. Yeah. That was. That's my, beautiful. My firm was all those. <laughs> <laughs> I know a little bit about that. <laughs> now so, that's affordable. <laughs> That, what's interesting is that used to be the Jackson Parkway Apartments. Yeah. It was a project. There were more hypodermic needles than bricks. Right. I mean, oh, it really? was horrific. And it came down, and we did some master planning, redesigned the neighborhood so that there was better flow of traffic for safety. Mm -hmm. And there's a rental section. And then right along Resnick, those are home ownership and rental. Um, but they, that has been up for 12 years. And they look almost as good they do. as the day they went up. And it is because the neighbors, you know, they take care of it. Um, it, it is a win-win-win for that's, the city because, gorgeous. yeah, I mean, the folks that live there, when, when it was being built, doctors were coming out of the medical center and coming there, like, poking around, ooh, new construction, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Knock up to the, like, can I buy one of the, no, actually, you can't <laughs> buy one of the. <laughs> you got to go somewhere else. And I mean, we are still amazed to go walk through. The rental units are still being, you know. Do you, do you have uh, voucher senses there, too? What's that? Do you have voucher tenants? In I'm sure there is in yeah. the rental. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I can't yeah. believe it, because if I go down to BJ's, I'll go down through that way. Looks like San Francisco. Oh, oh, it's a little gated They're in skyline. really great shape. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, Good design. I, I, Grew up in Holyoke, and I remember the neighborhood that Lynn described. Yeah. 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 It was pretty bad. Churchill was, was it was the, the old bedside. school. My, yeah, it was an old school notion of what what housing systems were supposed to look it like. It was the nineteen sixties and seventies yeah. barracks cement yeah. block. Just it's warehousing true. systems that were. So you were involved in that. I I can't take credit for it. I wasn't actually at the firm. Yes. Great job, anyways. No, All the great, people involved did a great job. No, it's a great little neighborhood, and it shows what you can do to take, mm -hmm. you know, a large chunk of ill-developed land yeah. <laughs> yeah. and put some thought behind it and make it safe, affordable, and attractive, and that it's successful. I mean, it's 12 years, and it's successful. And I'm sure there are no vacancies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have anything to do with that, but I'm sure there are not. Yeah. For sure. Hmm. Thank you for answering that. Anytime you want to ask any more about my firm's work, it was not a loaded question. Honestly, um, 
You got to the regulatory section, which was next yes. that I was going to talk about. Yeah. So, yeah. so you jumped ahead like you normally do. Yes. <laughs> um, but those are the you know the types of things about um, you know being more inclusionary to try to get more affordable units without having to necessarily construct new units are cost-effective ways for us to increase our housing stock. So there definitely will be things that we would be um, promoting. Um, also around um, some of the things that you see spelled out are things that have bubbled up. Um, at Wayne's Downtown Development Forum, we one of the things that came out of it was the ability to put some residential on the first floor, which typically gets restricted, but in the right development, if it wasn't street front, you know, if it was behind, are there ways to do that? And it seems like that's gaining a little bit of traction as well to, to have those zone change. So I think bringing people together, talking about what the obstacles are you know, to, to getting more units out, like I said, whether it's preserving, maintaining, or building new. Um, I think these are good conversations for us to be having. Um, around new housing production strategies, um, there's going to be a developer's forum that we're going to do. We were going to do it in May, but we've postponed it to the fall in deference to letting Wayne do his forum, forum about downtown development first. And uh, Audrey actually wanted to speak to that. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do for us just to diverge is in 2000 there was a uh, brochure put out and it was City Council and Mayor Higgins and I'd just like to read a couple of the first paragraphs about the challenges and opportunities because it's exactly what we're looking at today. Nothing seems to have really changed. And it talks about how, what a wonderful small city we are, which is true. I moved here permanently a couple of years ago because of what it had to offer. Plus my daughter was here, she's no longer here, but, but it, uh, there was so much diversity and there was so much acceptance of how anybody was, no matter what you did, you were looked at as a person. And I think that we need to keep that up and we won't unless we do have more affordable housing for people coming in. And if I can use myself, I came in as a senior and I couldn't find any housing. It, I had been on Michael's house list for a year and a half. It took a year and a half to get in. I was not even, I applied to all the subsidized housing from out of town trying to get something lined up, but it didn't work out. And I now understand that, say, Michael's house is closed there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Waiting list because it's two years long now. Wow. And it t it, I mean, people want. I think that this is something for seniors that we really need to address too, because as as you said, Councillor Lavars, pe older people are wanting to downsize. I don't want to own a home anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want a large place. I want to be someplace that's safe affordable, and I think there are an awful lot of us that feel that same way. Mm -hmm. And we cannot seem to house everybody, because we're also dealing with homeless, we're dealing with handicapped, we're dealing with uh, families and children, we're dealing with all sorts of things, and it just doesn't seem to be the uh, housing. One of the, some of the things that were mentioned was people that bought homes 20 years ago. Uh, they couldn't afford to buy them now. So how are their kids going to do it? Can't. They can't. The cost of home ownership, even condos, has increased so much that the average teacher, nurse, and it says firefighter, and I don't know what the story is with firefighters. I'm not that familiar. They're a good unit. Or police officer in Northampton. Now this is 2000 that this was written. Cannot afford to buy a home here. That, that, that's sad. Our shop owners. And you're still here. Right? Yeah, and our shop owners, you know. Mm -hmm. You have clerks that come in, and where do they work? Rental costs for a two-bedroom apartment are beyond the range of affordability for the average worker in the city. Many of our children cannot afford to rent or buy in the city in which they have grown up. We have the same problems. You know, exact same problems. Now, there is a mandated housing, affordable housing of 10%, which I'm sure you're aware of. We have 11.3, thanks to Peg. 
stock, but there is a growing gap on the misalignment of how demographics are changing the types of housing needed. Or, that's another thing. So we came, three of us came together in January, and we decided to brainstorm. We came up with this developer's forum idea because we figured that if we could possibly get enough people in the room that were looking in the same direction, we're talking about nonprofits, developers, uh, the mayor, hopefully you all, um, you know, people who will support this, that maybe we could shake something loose and see, and of course, what parcels there are that could be, mm -hmm. what could be moved. Um, we are in the process, and we'll be doing more of, it, of deciding how to go about this for it. The in, there will be invitees, but there will also be, it, it will be open to whomever can come. Because we feel that without the input of all these entities, we don't know how to, to proceed. I mean, we need, the, we need everybody in there at the table. And Wayne, we were going to be in May, but now we're October because of Wayne. We stayed in that, which is fine because we learned a lot uh, from him. But uh, and we'll also have real estate people, things like that. We're also hoping to have someone give a talk on uh, affordable housing finance because we feel that's very important to help developers and, and all of us. I mean, I am fairly new to the housing partnership, so I'm fairly new to the housing So I don't have that backlog of knowledge. Peg and would I, have, she'd know probably somebody who has that knowledge. Yeah, yeah we've been tossing around. Yeah, someone from THCD or Mass yeah. Housing Partnership. Or, so we'd be we happy would, to come out and talk about the toolbox that would be available. Right. To so we're, we're looking to put in a whole bunch I of I think that's going to be an excellent educational program. Yeah, we're hoping, and we're hoping that as I say, we'll shake something loose. You put everybody in the same room with the same focus, and we're hoping that somehow, because the production is down, way down for affordable housing. The CPC fund for this past year were almost non-existent for affordable housing. Of course, they did do Christopher um, Heights up in Village Hill, which is 43 of the 83 units are affordable. And that's, that's a big step. We do need that. We need to put in that place. So, anyway, we're we're open to any suggestions, comments, and we invite you all to come. <laughs> we will come. I have come to that. Please, we will. Yeah, as you point out, that that the, um, Claire's uh, comments from then and and what Lynn describes now actually has been kind of status quo. We've we've had a a relatively stable population level, um, and and that has largely to do with the configuration of the homes. That once upon a time, these are grand homes of how families of four or five, they became either they got parceled out, people started buying larger homes and just living and rattling around in them by themselves, or they were converted into multifamily structures or systems, and then since if now once again going back to single families in some cases, and now uh, in, in the other phenomenon about Northampton that I think distinguishes us from a number of other communities, we have, we, the thing that contributes to the vitality of the community is residents living down there. Absolutely. And uh, so that after five o'clock, after business hours, there were actually people wandering the streets. But the, the, the problem is, is, and the problem that you're describing is, is what level of income and affordability are the people who are wandering the streets as a result who are able to come out and, and commute? And another phenomenon about Northampton is our affordable housing systems were built from the periphery, not the downtown. They were built for the most part. Um, Florence Heights, Meadowbrook, uh, uh, Hampshire Heights, all you know, former um, housing that was built um, for returning veterans and things like that. But they're all not some barely part of a bus route. Mm -hmm. And so they're isolated pockets that, that don't have an integrated dimension into the community. And 
it has been our mission, and that was Claire's, actually, that was Claire's mantra was, of course, it was affordable housing and maintaining affordability in the community. Now, of course, it's a buzzword that uh, is a Rorschach test for a number of people. They look at the of what they, they, they project whatever they want on the concept of affordability, frequently ignoring the fact that we're talking about, two, you know, nine-tenths of the people who live in this country when we're talking about affordability. We're talking about people who, 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 who have worked one to two jobs trying to sustain a family and trying to just put their kids in public education and just trying to live and work within the community that they exist in. And that's always the trickiest problem. Those are the resistance that we get is what is construed as affordability at some level. And then there's all the ugly stuff that comes as a oh, result of that conversation. Know. And we're, and I think our part, our job is to make sure that the ugly stuff gets um, refuted and challenged, and um, at the same time promoting the good stuff and the, and the stuff that you describe. And and this, as I said, historically since Northampton's Renaissance in the '70s, that that essentially the, the circumstances you describe basically become trending that way, and then sort of remain that way for quite a while. Or Housing prices remain relatively stable, even though the rest of the country went mm -hmm. um, went the pot, and um, the uh, the appeal of the community is still pretty great. Consequently, there's a number of people who want to come move here who have the means to do it, but it is creating we run the risk of creating essentially a gated community where we're where we're, yeah. we're receiving the services from people who can't live here, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's my personal dread and horror. I really, I, I think that that is, that ruins the warp and weave of the community. I think that all the things that people profess to find appealing is completely decimated by the fact that you can right. <laughs> the, you. Then, then it just becomes like Disneyland, so. Yeah, and, and there is, there is a, a, an interconnectedness. I mean, even though we're charged with affordable housing, you know, for preserving and educating around that, that the reality is that there needs to be a range of housing across yes. all income Absolutely. levels in order to have a vibrant community and maintain a vibrant community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at Wayne's um, forum as well, we were making interconnections of housing and economic development. I mean, there's a reason why those two departments are <laughs> yeah. kind of together. And they do go hand in hand. And on one level, market rate housing, especially in the suburbs and bigger lots, will kind of take care of itself. Like, yeah. those people have the means, they'll figure it out if it's a vibrant, you know, community with a decent school system or access to private education, they'll come here. How do we take care of the rest of the people? And mm -hmm. like it or not, the machinations that have gone up at Village Hill, there was a clear realization by mass development that workforce housing whether or not that's truly affordable to those who are workers is a different conversation. But they, over the last several years, right, identified that smaller houses on smaller lots with a, you know, less of a expensive price point is where they needed to focus, and there's a reason. But that is still going to be its own village. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to deal still with the downtown to give the shopkeepers the opportunity to stay here. Mm -hmm. because people are coming in to spend their money and that we want to draw people from the outside to come in and we'll take their money as well but wouldn't it be nice to have folks who are it'd living nice here right yeah. right well that's age, age right and 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 as we are an aging cohort <laughs> um, the systems that are available for people who are aging are with the exception of a few retrofits, there's no new housing yeah. site that's being developed necessarily mm -hmm. for them, with the uh, exception of the Grantham Group's thing up on yeah. Village Hill, of course. And, uh, I mean, what you're describing is infill or density increasing, yeah. and um, and that's the point of resistance in some cases. Yeah. There's and, some, yeah. and all of us. This is being videotaped, but right? Density is kind of like photography, <laughs> right? Yeah, it does. I don't know if I can totally describe it, but I know no, it, it when I see it, right. and that there's appropriate density. And people, to say density is a bad word, right. isn't giving it a fair shake, because you could sit here with a PowerPoint mm -hmm. and show, you know, improperly planned density that will not work. 
but they're properly planned density that gives vibrancy, that gives people, nowadays again, with a sustainable lifestyle, you've got kids who don't want to and can't afford a car when they get out of school, and they'd rather exactly. be downtown. You, know, you look at Lawrence and Lowell and Fall River, and you know, which were these mill towns, the gateway cities you know, mm -hmm. that are redeveloping their mills, and all of a sudden you've got all these people coming back to these lots and live workspaces, and mm -hmm. you're getting these vibrant redevelopments with coffee houses and restaurants and theaters and art space and people downtown all the time working. We can do that here. Right, and we're going to keep to the it. businesses in North exactly. Hampton, too. See that, because yeah. talking with some of yeah. them, because I'm down here mostly every day, right, it's like, they're worried. Right. Because of the cost of rental. I mean, first mm -hmm. floor is running like 3400 a month. That's a lot of money. I, I'm afraid we're going to have a town of bars and cafes and, <laughs> and, you is, know, and a casino. <laughs> that, has, that has more to do with the internet than... Those are all. Those are all. The loss where I worked. Um, yes. All all um, pressures due to the expanding purchase power of uh, invested right. in, in in online right. purchasing. You can't buy online a drink yet or a haircut, and so those That's consequently right. are the right. businesses that are still thriving. But there is there's those pressures that we have to address some point and figure out what that's going to be to maintain local right, businesses at, and local enterprises. So. Look at my dear friend from Scaris. I mean, she has owned that for about four years. And like she said, they're getting, they're at that age. It's time to say it's retiring time. They've done what they have for the community. They always have participated in the community. So they put theirs up for sale within a month. Bingo. Somebody has bought it. You know, so well, one of my frustrations here is seeing the places like the defunct Northampton um, rehab place on Birch Street, the Catholic churches that won't allow people. You know, we, there's property here. How can we get get well, some utilized? Of the, yeah, I mean, the churches are a different thing. Yeah, they're they're very difficult to repurpose. Oh, like I they, agree, they've but, built these large such a edifices. Shame. And, yeah, it's there's a, it's a whole association of frustrations that we've actually rezoned to allow for protection, to allow people to facilitate uh, repurposing old churches. But they and that's what Florence Grammar has the same thing that allows mm -hmm. these 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 are non-conforming uses in neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, that, but allowing them to be repurposed for other things, give more flexibility, but still it's it's, it's a Large vaulted ceilings that you can't eat. And well, you know, I see the home shelter, shelter or the heating the the cost center right. for the arts, or you know, something. Yeah, right. just I mean, they're, they're unique uses, which yeah. just narrows your universe. Yes, so yeah. Right. Able to I mean, you even look in the paper, 55 and over, of what they're building. They're not cheap. Oh no, I mean, you know, <laughs> we're looking at some of them, 300 and something thousand. Is that affordable? No. Well, actually. We're assessed on affordability on the, in the same catchment area, Springfield, and I think HUD, I forgot what's HUD's current express rate of affordability for us. It's in, it's, it's for ownership? For household. ownership, yeah. Depends on the household size. It's about 56 grand for a two person household. So a lot of people would be eligible. 56 grand? Yeah. That's oh. income. Of right. income, and that's the that's yeah, not for the purpose right, of the exactly. house. <laughs> that is <laughs> people. <laughs> what if it was just one person? I think it's about twenty three or twenty four thousand. Yeah. That's well, what's considered. Oh. And the ice pond lottery, right? And that lottery was done. Yeah, that's affordable. It right. What two? Yeah. two, three houses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was that the was best. one, but though that. Depending on the um, family size, I want to say the affordability started at 189. It went up to like 220 or something like yeah, that. I have the list. That was the range somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah, yeah change. Well, that's not bad because I think one of the houses has two apartments to it. And uh, when they first designed that, I don't remember, Bill, you were a counselor. I was, no, that was when I was yeah. feeling better. But 
Yeah. It was one of the best developments. <laughs> it was one of the best developments that I saw because they had affordable mixed in yeah, and with higher level. You can't tell, tell the, difference. the difference until you walk right up to it. Well, that's what they're doing in Christopher Heights. Uh -huh. going to have, you're not going to know. Who and you know, and is, they, they actually and guarantee that affordability. Yeah. That that's part of the condition of. And you know. And I, I actually think the, the, the most challenging thing that faces all of us here is, is actually the education part that you described. I think it's, it's making the connection in people's minds about how critical this actually is and why it is critical and how we go about realizing it. Chapter 40B, we, because we at over 11.3% affordability, we, uh, you can't have a developer invoke the Chapter 40B exclusion of thing that allows them to bypass zoning, um, which is a good thing on one level. But the fact is, is that that um, it reduces the impetus in some cases for people to develop. Right. That's a system. very so, movable. Yes, I mean we're percentage. We, yeah. yeah, and when we hover around 11 percent, yeah. all it takes is for somebody to right. Come in build 20 or 30. Yeah, yeah about a unit to the subdivision. Yes, right. Exactly. So, you know, I'm hoping that we'll get your support. And anything that you can. Well, I, 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 am, I am committed to work with you guys to, to, to do this. I, I, I personally am, anyway. And I, I, don't, I think you see. Uh, I, I think you get universal support from the council for the most part. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like us to do, let us know. Well, I think, you know, coming to that forum or having any ideas or yeah. comments is going to be a great help because I think the more people see that the city, the people of the city, mm -hmm. the mayor, the councilors are involved in this, it's going to make a difference. It's not just some partnership <laughs> and shooting things. Yeah. Maybe possibly when you find out when that developer's form is going to be. October 7th. October 7th from 3 to 5 p.m. <laughs> or maybe what we could do is, our council president, you could, he could place you on our agenda for a presentation and you could come in and talk about that. Yes, yeah, not a terrible idea. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, we don't, That's good visibility. We don't plan right? that far in advance, right. but yeah, no, you guys do, but actually I think it would be, um, it would be appropriate to actually make a presentation before the forum or even after the forum after. as a follow-up for It would be nice to have an yeah. after because yeah. if you all if, if you all are going to be there, you know, hopefully the council, right. council will, we can get feedback from them right. Right. as to how it went and where we could go. Right, that might be a little yeah. more of an interesting yeah. presentation yeah. what happened then you and can, what we could. And when you bring your PowerPoint back. Excellent. I'm waiting for it. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 My 13 year old says it's all about present now. So I'm going to give up. That's right. That's right. It's because I, I was actually going to ban PowerPoint in my august authorities as council president, but I, I realized that, that would be. People would be resistant. Well, Mike, I could sue you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well, that would go great. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that you want us to do, fundraising, I'll keep wow. my shot. I, I, you know, I, I'm saying she's, she's, she's going to start promising the sun the well, moment starts. You know, it's just wonderful having the support. I mean, as I say, I'm new to it. I, I worked in housing in my former life. I was a geriatric psychologist in senior housing. But being in, in Northampton and trying to develop right. it. My mom is a gerontologist and a, and a consultant for development of uh, assisted living systems and things like that. Uh, yeah, I help design and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's part of my uh, upbringing. See, that's great <laughs> because that's that's what's needed. I mean, yeah, we need well, that's where we're all going. Really, we're oh, all yeah. headed. It's we're early in that direction. I mean, I'm oh that boy, well, we have a nice place. <laughs> well, It'll we as a demographic. Happy. The baby boomers is a demographic control, the money and control everything else, and the, the, things uh, are going to change. Things things, things will oh, change. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, for everyone who comes after us, yeah. since we determine all the criteria and the priorities, 
people coming after us are pretty, they're SOL, as you say, and that, that you know, they, they, and that's not fair. They're burdened with lots of money if they have educational loans out, and then at the same time, you know, we're, we're building assisted living systems for us, and then, you know, yeah, you can have what we leave. Uh, right, see, that's what has to be affordable. If you can afford it, possibly. But there is, I mean, there's, we're right now, we're peaking, we're starting to peak because it's the baby boom is definitely. I, just, I went to a wedding Saturday, and my nephew is a physician assistant, $120,000 worth of loans. Oh, that is so sad. It I is mean, sad to be paying for that. I mean, they just bought a house and everything, but you'll be paying for that for a long time. You know, the thing is the stress works on you. Like Bill was saying, it is. Them. They're going to have a lot of pressure. Yeah. Good thing they're in love. Did we ever do... Good thing a lot of them are legally allowed to be in love now. That's really nice. <laughs> That's really nice. Really yeah, we're really... And if we could just get the federal to pass that, then we can collect more taxes. But it all works out, right? Yeah, well, some, you know, bigotry trumps common sense frequently, so. Oh, that, that just, <laughs> Peg, have we ever done a, I can't remember, Bill, what? a proclamation on affordable housing? Oh, yes. I think I'm we have sure. rafts of When was the one that we did? 2000. In 2000. Do you have my... No, I did I steal it? No, I gave it back to you. Maybe it's time to upgrade it. Oh. <laughs> we are having some... Um, one of our members, Martha, a resolution. Yeah. yeah, she's having um, students update. We did a survey out to some landlords on tenancy, tenancy preservation. Mm -hmm. We'll be getting the results back soon. And they're also updating um, what Audrey read from that went out in that mailing. I don't know that we're going to have the money to mail it out, but they're updating some Well, that's another thing. Statistics. If we could mail it out to everybody with a blurb in as to what we're trying to do. Right. It might. Well, uh, where we get the there is there. I mean, you know, there's the the free way of transmitting electronically. Yes. So yes. There's, there's Thank that. you. Uh, cuts down on your mailing cycle. I know. So, but you know, it gets in there with all the other pictures of kittens doing silly things and yeah. stuff. So, hey. <laughs> but um, yes, I think you have our. Our commitment to this, is, which has been ongoing, actually, our commitment to affordability in this oh, yes. community, and and beyond, you know, we I think we certainly want to take it way beyond lip service, right. and yeah. you know, just feeling good yeah. about ourselves. We're, there's right. there's no smugness here. I think we we have a lot of work to do. So. Yeah. A lot of work. To do. You figure since the year of two thousand. Are we still talking about the same thing? Yeah, time? well, we had a little blip in yeah, the middle there. Yeah, we had a little blip. Right? Yeah, yeah, there was a little. Just coming that's, out. That's there was a little housing a crisis. Years <laughs> years. Like that. It's just, yeah. you know, the, the economy collapsed. Well, you know, that. Yeah. And it's, and it's you know, just right. gradually it's, getting out of its well, well, But the good thing about a gradual recovery means it could be long. Well, yes. let's hope. Yeah. Now versus a especially if, especially if you recognize it and work accordingly and actually create long term planning that allow you to survive things like that. So, so. That's why. Peg, thank you for okay. being here. We appreciate you seeing your face all the time at these meetings. Thank you for and the opportunity to give you an update yes, on what we're doing. And, thank you. About and it. when you have an interesting meeting coming up, Do we? please let oh, me know. Oh, you have one? one. Oh. Yeah, we need you have First one. First Monday of every month. Yeah, but I'm talking about something that, that we're it deals with this type of thing. thing. Yeah. Well, if you have any comments or suggestions that you think about later, could you convey them to us? Oh, surely. Absolutely. Because we are open to any, I mean, we want to get everybody in the room. Yeah. We're open to any suggestions. Actually, let me give you Thank my you. card here, Audrey. Excellent. Peg, Thank you, you can give us your friend of a Carl voice very much. You're really taciturn. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. <laughs> oh, that's, that's me. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, give one to me, too. Yeah, because yeah, I don't know how to knock on your door. Thank you, Audrey, for being here. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. It's nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice, nice meeting you. If you want to see the film, this is where it'll be. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. Hmm? It was nice meeting you. Now I can put a face to the name. <laughs> Well, I've got a face to your name, too. But, uh -oh. but, but uh, I, you know, I...
didn't know. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> You're welcome. Mary Ann, come on right up here. Sit. Peg, you're welcome to come and sit. I'm just going to, yeah, listen for a little while. Thanks. Is Laura coming? No, Laura's actually on vacation. Oh. She's, uh, she got an opportunity to go to Honduras. Oh. So it's sort of hard to compete with that, I think. I so. think so. Hi. Going to Honduras for fun or for? Well, she has a cousin there who's doing some social justice work. So right. she's, you know, kind of a combination of Yeah, you know. And, you know. There's some like, tough times in the Honduras, so yeah, it's, not, it's not like going to Aruba. I know, <laughs> I know. So. Marianne, we want to welcome you to Thank Social you. Services and Veterans Affairs, and it's a pleasure having you here. Well, it's First great time to be here. Yes, thank, thank you. So you're going to talk about an overview of Safe Passage right. and your vision and your approach and about domestic violence prevention mm -hmm. and your new initiative. So I'm leaving the floor to you. And okay. Take your time. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate having a chunk of time. It's so often that they say, we want all of these things and you have three and a half minutes on right. the agenda. Yes, so yes. it's just great to have the opportunity to um, just kind of engage in a conversation about this. You know I, Counselor at large, our Council President, Bill Joy. Yes, we've um, met before. Um, yes. City Councilor Mary Ann yes. Large from Ward 6, and mm -hmm. that's Ruth McGrath who's doing the videoing okay. Hi. for Hi. Adam Cohen North Street Association. Okay. And you know Peg Keller. We just met, yes. Oh, you just met. Okay. Yes. Oh, so okay. Nice. I guess Yes. yes. Hope you feel better. <laughs> yes. Everybody's spring cold is miserable. Yet. In winter cold, you can live through, but spring yeah. cold. So she's, she's sitting like a pariah. Uh, I know. Okay. <laughs> right. Don't get me laughing. Right. So I am. Um, you know, it's sort of, still sort of a very broad agenda. So feel free to you know sort of okay. you know ask questions or interject or whatever. I I brought some key um, pieces of paper to kind of guide our discussion and to leave you with some of these things. You know, you can read or, you know, you can get more information on our website, but I just thought this was a great opportunity to um, to sort of tell you a little bit about, from our perspective, the incidents and the issue of domestic violence and what we're trying to do about it. So I've been here almost two years. In June, it'll be two years that I've been the Executive Director at Safe Passage, and uh, time has flown by joyfully. It's probably one of the best... Uh, I think it's the best job in Northampton. You know, no offense to anybody else's other jobs, but you yeah. know, I'm really happy to have landed here. And um, I've been working on issues of violence against women for about 30 years. And um, one of the reasons that I was drawn to this job in particular and this community in particular is because what the work that needs to happen related to domestic violence and this community's um, generosity, forward thinking, ability to organize is a great match. So our work has the promise to really thrive and grow in this area. And we have a, a board of directors that's getting more, more, more of a handle on that and the match between what needs to happen and our community. Um, we've grown from about you know five members on the board when I started to 10 now. We're recruiting three or four more who will join us in our annual meeting in June. So. We're really building a, um, a stronger board of directors. Um, we've incorporated some advanced training among our staff, so we've really made a commitment to um, increasing not just the number of staff, but really the skill level and the um, compensation. So when most organizations around us have been, have been hearing a lot about you know, layoffs over the last couple of years, we've actually been in a position, because of this community's generosity and goodwill, to um, upgrade our, um, our personnel structure. We've done some, some readjustments of salaries toward, you know, a little bit higher to try to okay. encourage longevity. And we really want people, you know, we have this goal, you know, from the personnel perspective that if you want to do social justice work, if you want to work on violence against women, you need to work at Safe Passage for a while. Mm -hmm. And so that's been kind of what we've been uh, working on. And we find that for people even who now work at other organizations or around, they really draw on this experience because it really um, sort of integrates a lot of things. I mean, domestic violence is not just a field or not just a problem unto itself. It overlaps 
with just about every other social justice issue that there is. Um, we've recently done some work with um, the Veterans Education Project on the issues of you know, sexual assault in the military and you know, that sort of thing. So anything that, you, that you're concerned about, whether it's housing, whether it's um, teen pregnancy, health, everything, has some connection to the work that we do. And that's really the, you know, the message in many ways that we're trying to promote. How many so, employees do you have? We're, um, we have 10 full-time employees right now, um, two or three part-time in the office and the staff. And then we have a cadre of part-time people who do shelter relief work you know, over nights and weekends. So we staff our shelter and our um, domestic violence intervention project 24-7. So those are more part-time people. So all in all, on the payroll, we have about 25 people. Um, nine, nine are full-time. So, so this, um, this packet has some um, sort of pieces of information, but the one I'd call your attention to is the um, executive summary which is on the left-hand side. This is the executive summary of the um, strategic plan that we launched about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, I have the full strategic plan. It's, it's much longer, so if you, really, if you want to digest it, you're welcome to. I can get you a copy. Um, but this kind of gives you a sort of a lay of the land about how we're organized, what the key areas are that we're working on developing, and what our guiding principles are. So we. You know, we start with our mission. We have a pretty broad mission about ending domestic violence. And if that doesn't work out, we'll end oppression <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so, um, but we're really trying to operate, we're trying to be an organization that, rather than being against domestic violence, is for a community that's free of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And there's a subtle, and so rather than being about providing services, we're really trying to be about being of service. And when we do those two paradigm shifts as a staff and as a board, everything has changed. You know, everything's changed from being responsive and being against something to really being able to think in a more forward-thinking way, which is how we engage in our strategic planning process, about what can we promote within the community that could bring us closer to an end to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And sort of thinking in those terms has really opened up avenues of collaboration and um, and you know, different ways that we can really be of service that's based in um, what we call, is kind of jargony, but a survivor-centered approach. So our whole approach is based in many ways in the same way it was, you know, 35 years ago um, when organizations like Safe Passage, at the time the Sacerdotes, started up, basically based on listening to survivors and listening to survivors' stories, what they told us about what they needed, about how the systems um, needed to be reformed, um, what was helpful, what was not helpful, it really sort of started in that advocacy world. Now that we know something about that, we still maintain that, that grounding in what survivors, survivors in our shelter, survivors on our volunteer staff, on our paid staff, continue to tell us um, as that work develops. So there's a, there's a number of emerging issues that we're connecting with nationally that we're what we either have brought to Northampton or are um, in the process of bringing to, to the community. So, can I, can yes. I ask you, like, one of them is transitional and permanent housing? Mm -hmm. Who do you work with on the permanent housing? Well, we, we do a lot of work with um, the housing authorities, uh, many of, and, you know, private landlords. Many people who come to our shelter come from other parts of the state, and then as they're resettling, I would say about half um, work on resettling close to Northampton. They might settle in Northampton, East Hampton. Um, others resettle elsewhere. So it, it really kind of depends on each family's circumstance. Um, and that's concerning shelter, um, because it's such a transitional population that um, you know it's difficult to, to house somebody safely in the same community where they were being abused, especially if the abuser is still here connections. So a lot of what we do is help is to try to develop plans for safety and resettling elsewhere or for people coming here if they were abused in other places. So um, this is a community that's really desirable for a lot of people because of its close knit appeal. There's you know the entrepreneurial spirit and the emphasis on local business and 
you know, the local economy is really conducive to formerly battered women mm -hmm. because, you know, this is a place where they can start businesses. They, they can join local businesses. Um, and it's sort of a different flavor than many other communities. So people are coming here from, we had one woman um, and her family come here via Florida after surviving the earthquake in Haiti. So after the earthquake, she and her husband at the time, her two kids, got to Florida, and then the violence, you know, the violence by the abuser got so bad that she knew she had to escape. She went to the airport. The, the least expensive flight she could find that would, that would get her out of town was to Boston. Was okay? it with her children? Yeah, she was with her two children. Wow. They were 16 and 12. So, um, so she ended up in Boston, didn't know a thing about Boston, connected to our statewide network, which is, um, you know, through SafeLink, we have a network where we, um, you know, do crisis intervention for people who call, but also there's a computerized um, shelter bed update that's updated twice a day for every single shelter. Mm -hmm. So she found out through that that we had an opening, called, we accepted her, and so she, she moved to our shelter. And so she and her two kids came to shelter, slept for about two weeks, <laughs> you know, really, once they got here after all of that. Um, and then right around that time, um, we got a, a small grant from Verizon Foundation who was interested in bringing entrepreneurial training and business planning to, to the issue of domestic violence. So they, they helped us form a class of survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault um, where 25 women learned how to form a business plan. And for those who finished a business plan, there were 12 of them all together. Verizon gave them the startup money to start their businesses. Wow. So this woman, so that startup money was anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000. Well, this woman came, and the entire time she was there, she cooked, you know, Caribbean food for the entire shelter. Like, she wouldn't let anybody else cook. And so she's opening a restaurant in Southampton in this fall. So there's this, these great stories of, like, resilience and um, excitement and really starting over. I mean, I, don't, I personally don't know how she did that And they're that giving whole, them money to open up a business? They actually, part of this grant from Verizon was startup funds cash for these women so seed money for this, yeah. it was seed money so um, another woman started a photography a creative photography studio um, another woman started a dog grooming and walking business so these are small but these aren't like yeah, that's great, you know though. new you know IBMs or whatever but they're small businesses services that people need that are sprouting up around Hampshire County and around this area um, we, we want to do more of that so one of the areas that we're really trying to develop in our strategic plan is a whole area around economic development tied to um, what what people need who have experienced domestic violence. And so some of the things some of the things that they need are the same things that everybody needs. They need the information, they need the skills, they need the startup money. But then some of the other things that that um, they need are businesses who are aware of how to do safety planning, mm -hmm. of how to how to help keep someone safe and protected if they have a restraining order against someone and that person comes to their workplace. Mm -hmm. Because very often, um, very often someone who, for example, someone who works you know, at a company, nine to five, their abuser shows up, you know, and there's a restraining order. Without, the edu without that education, that business owner might say, oh, well, this is putting everybody at risk. I'm gonna look not so favorably on this person who really is the victim of the domestic violence. So part of our economic initiative would be working with businesses to really figure out how to develop safety plans mm -hmm. that, that can help keep everyone safe, but also help support and protect their employees rather than you know, put them on warnings or ostracize them. So there's a policy level around that, there's some, some training, and there's just some, some work on engaging people. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of people really see us for our shelter, which is a hugely important part of our work. Mm -hmm. um, is that what, just we're, strictly we're, for women? No, no. Oh, okay. um, I was just curious about that because right. I've heard of it started that where way. men were abused by <laughs> their wives. Well, the mm -hmm. statistically, 95% of all violent, 90 to 95% of all violent crime is committed by men. So mm -hmm. I imagine disproportionately well, not to, it, it is proportional. 95%? It's, 
Well, 90 percent. It depends if you aggregate all the all the murder, mayhem, rape, mm -hmm. uh, everything else. It's it's 90 to 95 percent males who commit those things. Yeah, it's still so it's, a, it's still a huge proportion. I mean, yeah, different studies will tell you different things. Yeah. Um, there's a similar risk, though, in same-sex relationships yeah. as heterosexual relationships. So um, most of the men who come to us as victims were may have been victimized by another man, mm -hmm. or um, that in possibly in the past. Um, we certainly work with some men where who were abused or maybe assaulted. There's a difference mm -hmm. in terms of definition between abuse and assault. Okay. And so that's one of the things. I mean, certainly within an abusive relationship, each might assault or defend themselves against the other, depending on the circumstance. And okay. part of the part of the tricky thing about working in sort of applying what we know about domestic violence to like. Law, the legal system or law enforcement is that law enforcement is very used to looking at a particular incident. Right. Like, okay, this is this is a car in your name. Someone else took your keys and drove off with it. That's pretty clear that that person stole your car, right? And so it's based on that one incident, and there's not like it, like the circumstances of the relationship really that comes into play. In domestic violence, you know, very often law enforcement might want to take one one incident and maybe. The person who's the primary abuser is the one in that incident that ended up with a black eye, but maybe, maybe that's because he, you know, was threatening her to the point, or you know, where that was a defense mechanism. So it's very important to look at the entire set of dynamics around domestic violence, and also look at the emotional and verbal, uh, uh, you know, aspects of it, mm -hmm. the financial abuse aspects of it, um, the control. It's really who has the power and who has the control in that relationship. That's so interesting. You know? In, in, as you said, I mean, going back to the original mission of, um, of the survivor, talking to the survivors, but you guys also do, you do education in the community on just what you described, mm -hmm. that essentially what accounts, what, what, what represents an abusive relationship? What, mm -hmm. what represents a state of abuse? And there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of ignorance associated right. with this, mm -hmm. and, and also the fact that um, even the way we structure our language, the, when you say um, you know an abused woman, that takes out the whole dimension of abused by whom. Mm -hmm. It's a very right. passive thing. It's, right. it's rendered. The woman who is the object of, mm -hmm. of who is right. the victim mm -hmm. is now you completely excluded the whole context and conversation of the fact that a man abused a woman, mm -hmm. and that right. this man abused mm -hmm. this yeah. woman, right. and and we don't and that actually affects the way the whole community as a culture right. functions and reacts right. to abusive situations. So that they essentially looking at, in some cases that you're a collection of abuse of victims right. and with. And completely separated from the fact that crimes and yeah. power dynamics and people also talk about things. domestic violence as something that happens, like right, a like tornado. Ground. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like no, it doesn't. You know, it is one person exerting power and control over somebody using some kind of force, and so and Would it's it a pattern. Like it's a, a verbal systematic force pattern. Too? Would you call that? I certainly. Abusive? Well, I've talked with I've talked with people who are abused that never were assaulted physically in that context. But they felt like they were so close because of ongoing threats or intimidation. Verbally. Ver verbally, um, spiritually, culturally. Um, but when, we t when we work with communities that are marginalized in any way, um, one of the things that, that abusers seem to be very good at is taking the tools of the oppression. So for example, you know, if a woman is here um, you know, either undocumented or documented, you know, attached to to her husband, and there's abuse there. Um, all that all that abuser has to do is say, "Well, I'm going to tell the police this, this, and this, and then you're going to be deported." But the kids are staying here, and it doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be carried out. But that threat is enough to maintain that control. And to so actually the, take the kids away and move the other person out. Well, that can be the fear. So people sometimes right. react more to the fear, you know, mm -hmm. than than what might be the, the actuality. So we work. Um, there's there's this way that sort of the way oppression kind of similar in, in the same sex relationships. 
an abuser can maintain a lot of control by threatening to out the person, maybe to a workplace that's homophobic where it's not safe to be out, or to you know, a relative who you know, they don't want to lose, but they know would not understand. So mm -hmm. all it takes sometimes is that, is that threat. Okay. And I've certainly, you know, I remember talking with a, with a woman who um, whose abuser basically cut out newspaper clippings of domestic violence homicides and would like leave it on the kitchen table or leave it like, okay, yeah. check this out, you know? He didn't have to like have to say hit her, to say, say yeah. anything, anything like that, and that's enough of a fear. So, so it's important to understand the, that it's really more of a system and it's a sort of a dynamic mm -hmm. rather than like a series of single crimes. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you're, yeah. and I think the, the cogent point here is that they're not necessarily providing shelter for people who are victims of what would be qualified or classified as crimes or even prosecuted as crimes, but people mm -hmm. who have actually experienced um, this, this power separation and mm -hmm. or have been subjugated or, or have undergone a great deal of stress or, or mm -hmm. abuse in that sense, right. whereas it hasn't necessarily been determined by a court or a police right. officer that, yeah. that mm -hmm. As you said, what they need is someone who was hit and someone who evidently hit them. Right. And that's mm -hmm. essentially how the court defines, mm -hmm. uh, the law is legally defined. Mm -hmm. And you're not a legal system, you're a support system for people who, right. are, who, are, who are living in jeopardy or sense they have a sense right. of jeopardy and then providing mm -hmm. a safe place to feel secure from someone who is their tormentor. But you do have a legal. We do have a legal program. Right. Um, and that... That is a, an attorney, and a, we have a cadre of panel attorneys who work for, you know, we have a small stipend that we can provide um, to do full representation and probate of family court. Okay. So, I mean, we, we're not prosecutors, obviously, right. and we're not evidence gatherers, but we will support people who, who do choose that route. I mean, certainly there are many people come to us where yeah. crimes have been committed against them, mm -hmm. yet that's not their primary, you know, sometimes you think, well, prosecuting this assault, that has to be the primary thing, but mm -hmm. if they're homeless, if <coughs> they have no income, they, you know, their children are traumatized, those are the things that they put their energy toward. So we don't see a, we don't see a matchup necessarily between prosecution in terms of like going to the district attorney's office and criminal mm -hmm. charges. We see more people who seek restraining orders or protection from the legal system, which is a civil issue. So if you go and, and, and get a, a, a protection order, a restraining order, then you're engaging in a civil process, and it's not a criminal process until until there's a violation of that. So what we see, what we support people who are doing criminal cases, is more often when the abuser has violated that restraining order, and they really that's really their means of protection, continued protection. Yeah. How many houses do you have? That's a show. We have one house that has six room for six families at a time. And one of our rooms, across our statewide network, um, we have one of the three rooms that are fully, um, that, that are fully um, accessible for people with disabilities. So we have a very strong disability program. I know that you've worked with Tori, who's, mm -hmm. who's our um, disability advocate. But that, that one room was specifically designed for you know, a wide variety of mobility and sensory and communication disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so that's really reserved for either, for a family where either the, the adult or a child has either a permanent or a temporary disability. So we very often um, house people who are just coming out of the hospital with severe injuries. So sometimes if there, if there is a, an attempted murder or an assault, that's, really, that's, that's serious. And then after a hospitalization, we're one of the places where people come. So we've worked with some very severely injured um, people with a lot of medical um, needs, a lot of medical issues. Um, there's also a long-term impact of trauma that affects people's health. And so a lot of people who, you know, may have lived with domestic violence for years and years and years have sort of chronic illnesses that really sort of develop into disabilities also. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge need for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I couldn't have, like, paid you ahead of time to, to do a nicer transition into our prevention work. Um, we, but that's, um, we have a little, I have a little description of our, our new prevention initiative that we're launching this fall. Um,
um, we, we went back and forth over sort of what to call this, and we, we ended up calling it Say Something. So we're in the process of developing um, a new website, it's saysomethingnow.org, um, and the whole idea is that in order to bring us closer to this community that you've described and that we all have a vision of where violence doesn't happen, we have to promote certain things within our community, and one of that is improved relationships among people who aren't necessarily involved either as a victim or as a perpetrator, but ordinary people as bystanders. Mm -hmm. And bystanders is kind of like a public health kind of jargony word, but the idea is that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, who you come in contact with, there's somebody in your life, there's something that you can say to somebody that helps us bring, bring our community closer. So some of those, you know, a lot of prevention programs that are out there I feel kind of give people a lot of information. Like, here's the statistics, here's the dynamics, and then they say, okay, go do something, right? But then very often people are still left with, like, I'm not sure, like, all right, I think there's domestic violence happening next door or down the street, but I don't know what to say or who to say it to or anything. So the whole idea of our initiative is to really, is to really help people think through those situations, give them the skills and practice on what can you say? How do you make those decisions about what to say to whom? I mean, are you going to go up to an abuser with a bat in his hand? No, you know, I hope not. You know, but is there something that you could say to that victim? Is there something that you can say, you know, with three or four other neighbors? Um, you know, so to really help people understand what their options are and develop their skills, um, it's really, you know, it's really um, customized. It's going to be customized for like teachers and coaches and people who have sort of influence as parents over young people. Um, you know, to say things like, um, that really promote what a healthy relationship is. Um, to teach parents, you know, I have a, I have a 17 year old son, and um, you know, when I overhear conversations sometimes between him and his friends, you know, sometimes I have that moment, I mean, even I do this work, and I have this momentary thing, like, okay, what do I say in this situation when you know, this talk about girls and everything has gotten to this point where it, you know, doesn't feel comfortable. And so I like intentionally figure out ways to like inject myself into that <laughs> conversation or follow up on it afterwards and, and talk with them. And so the idea of this was, is to give people, ordinary people, that skill and that motivation and to get them involved in our prevention efforts that way. So it's a different kind of approach than many prevention mm -hmm. programs because a lot of prevention initiatives sort of bring education to high schools or to middle schools right. or to different groups, we're really doing more of an organizing approach where anybody can go through, we have, we'll have a four session kind of orientation to this, so, and we'll be training facilitators to do these sessions. The idea being that after that, you would have some goals in mind. You'd go out and maybe practice, do something, and then stay connected through our website and through some forums that we'll build and you know, that sort of thing. So, How are you gonna do it? Um, we are, we're going to start with our own volunteer force and our own board um, and people who, you know, we have, we have a, a large, you know, we have a large donor base, you know, if you know about our hot chocolate runs, yeah, so, that's you know, the hot chocolate runs we're going to that. use. I've heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, really, I mean, the hot chocolate run has grown into this great fundraiser, but it's also grown into this time right. where everybody who cares about this issue in the area shows up. So, we're, you know, you can expect to see a big splash around there so that we can, um, you know, at least, you know, give people some dates and try to encourage them. How we much had a booth at Gay Pride, we, you know, so yeah. we'll, we'll be doing outreach. How much did you raise on this last? Um, was that like 235000 something like that? Our, our net was about 230000 so yeah, it was, it's great. It's it's grown from I think eight thousand dollars the first it's year. The first one. So and this year will be our tenth year. So we have some uh, some fun in store. It's it's. And is that the only funding source? What else do you have? Um, it's about twenty five percent of our budget now. Um, okay. Our other funding sources and our annual report has, which I provided, has a one page with a little pie chart that kind of gives the mm -hmm. brief summary, but. Um, still a little under half is government funding. We get our, our main funding is from the Department of Children and Families. Mm -hmm. um, we have two federal grants, one through victim compensation, 
um, and for the Mass Office of Victim Assistance. This is money. A lot of people don't realize that, but um, if for for people who are charged and convicted of a federal level crime and fined, that fine goes into this pot of money that then gets distributed to both victim service programs and victim compensation. So it's kind of yeah, it's kind of interesting that it recycles right back. It's one of the original recycling programs. Um, also, violence, the Violence Against Women Act provides um, a grant for our Latino and um, immigrant and refugee work. And then you know, we have assorted other foundations. Um, we're launching a major donor campaign in addition to the hot chocolate run based on that. So this gives you a little bit of a breakdown of our, yeah. Little These are excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've, I've thank talked you. to Sarah Smith a couple of times about yes. it. She's sort of what, the hot chocolate no. yeah. <laughs> market? Yeah. And, and funding for, for your program altogether. Right. Well, that's her, yeah, that's her uh, purpose in life. Yeah. And Sarah, and, and I'm really, I'm really lucky to, to work with people like Sarah. You, know, you can imagine. She's, uh, she never stops, <laughs> never, uh, never stops learning and never stops figuring out what's next. Now, so. are you connected like you've just met Ted Keller for the first time, you said? Yes, but I think probably our advocates and our staff are, are probably like on the phone with each other on a daily basis, right? Um, Anthea, who works with her, comes to the next step meetings with the other housing yes. and homeless service providers. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And over the years, you know, we've seen people occasionally mm -hmm. um, come and go. That's so, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I'd never really just heard a presentation, so it was huh? really amazing. And wow. yeah, your stuff is Thank awesome. Well, um, and end the rival of many nonprofits. I mean, the envy. Of, I know. <laughs> right, right. For that, yes, I've never seen them for that come amount for of money. CDBG grants. But for that, I, no, they haven't applied. No. The, Why I, haven't you applied? Very good question. I'm going to have to ask Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I think we also, um, I mean, we're also really aware of right. sort of the limitations around that and really support right. a lot of the other programs. I mean, I think for us, making, you know, Having the programs that CDBG supports, having them be strong and viable, is also a help to us. So, yeah. so we kind of think strategically, and we don't want to, um, you know. I, they're, they're there was robust agency. There, there was an allocation said. years ago. Really? Um, okay. And it. We allocated during necessities, necessity, I was mm -hmm. would, right? Yeah, it was you know when they went into 43 Center because the right. shelter needs to be, the location is confidential, obviously. Right. Yeah. So right. We couldn't give money to the shelter and take the risk that it would be named. Oh, um, so so we gave to the administrative offices at 43 Center. Mm -hmm. And I can't even remember how much it was, but it was a long time ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. Back when okay. Watch Rent was actually right. had right. Yeah. So. Yeah. We also, I mean, one of the things that we're trying, we're working on figuring out is this issue of transitional housing in Hampshire County overall. Um, in other counties, there are, you know, two to five year apartments or townhouses or transitional housing specifically for people in transition from violence to safety and th that doesn't really that doesn't exist in Hampshire County so we're you know we we've, we've been you know we were targeted to try to figure out what would make sense in this area because if we had even four or five units available you know, for some families that are either hard to place or mm -hmm. want to stay here but don't have the formula of income or education or transportation or whatever, that would be a great thing. We had um, we had hoped for that something would work out in East Hampton, but mm -hmm. um, that doesn't seem to be working out. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of an issue that's still on the horizon and that we're still the leading to explore. Of that. Um, I'm thinking maybe McKinney money. You know, yeah. I mm -hmm. offloaded the continuum to Hilltown CDC, but we should talk. Dave okay. Christopoulos is, is the convener now, and every year there's the ability to apply for a new project. It's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of money, but it could be subsidies for maybe mm -hmm. three or four units. Mm -hmm. So it might be Definitely. kind of perfect. Yeah. Soldier On kind yeah. of comes in regularly. Yes. Right. They mm -hmm. came in the last round for a new piece at, at Leeds, but. It's a small enough amount of money because it's capped based on a formula. Mm -hmm. It's a small enough amount that a lot of people don't want to entertain another funding source because mm -hmm. it's a pain in the butt. Right. Mm -hmm. But for something like that, and even in a scattered site location, it might be kind of perfect. That so might be. Yeah, that might be. I'll hook you guys up. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peg. Um, I work for Media Education Foundation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, uh, I don't know if you have 
we provide access to the videos for, yeah. mm -hmm. for agencies, and I think say Passage used to be a beneficiary of some of those. We use them all the time for our okay. training and for certain presentations and things. Yeah, we've, uh, we're still a close I've, relationship. I've been immersed. We hang out. At, we hang out in the building. Yes. I've been. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're about to do a Kickstarter campaign for these uh, tough guys too. Right. So mm -hmm. we've been. We have been saturated with Jackson stuff and Jackson. Right. And we've been back and forth. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I mean, it's um, it's really kind of amazing, that, and the whole shift that we're trying to do is also you know, there's some parallels to that happening nationally. Right, so right. Mm -hmm. a lot of the national policymakers and people are really starting to think about how to really sort of build and grow communities rather than how to like how to how to suppress violence or how to prosecute it, which is important. But at the same time, if you're trying to end something, you have to think about what are you really moving toward. Well, that was it. You know, Stupid bill uh, prompted a lot of those conversations. Yeah, that the, exactly. the Amherst uh, mm -hmm. rape revelations mm -hmm. right. did the same thing. Right, right. And so, how is it that a, a community like Amherst College, that has the cream of the crop, so mm -hmm. to speak, and how could something like this how, how, exactly happen? How this function? And, and, right. and again, it was with that same passive language, though. Mm -hmm. it was the, Mm -hmm. It was. It was. Uh, how could rape happen? Yeah. Right. Was, yes. It was, how could rape happen? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a it just sort of spontaneously yeah. happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and in the, uh, in, but expanding that, and that was Jackson's push is to expand the conversation mm -hmm. and put it back where it belongs. I mean, you right. know, calling rape a, a woman a women's issue is describing is completely taking the fact that. Men have no culpability. Right. And it, mm -hmm. it relieves them of right. a liability right. that that that, mm -hmm. that right. it is being committed by some right. mm -hmm. and, and men don't have to address those issues or have not been forced to until right. mm -hmm. starting recently that Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's where our prevention campaign can really sort of make a difference. And also where some of our work in um, high risk assessment, I don't know if you're familiar with this with this um, model, but um, there's um, some pretty solid research that's come out now about six or seven years ago that has indicated, that helps us indicate which, which batterers are at highest risk for attempting or committing homicide. And so there's the ability, we have the ability now, you know, based on probability, not based on any, you know, 100% certainty, but we can look at cases and law enforcement can look at cases and really kind of discern which which cases actually have the most potential to end up, you know, as a homicide, um, and with that information, that that case can then be transferred to what we call a high risk assessment team. So we serve on this team. It's organized by the DA's office, and there's one team for Hampshire County, one team for Franklin County. Mm -hmm. So and and it starts mostly with most of the time it starts with a law enforcement assessment. So. Every police officer in Hampshire County, and, and I think just about across the state, has been trained in this model. They have checklists that help them understand. I mean, it's sort of, we kind of joke, it's kind of like those old cosmopolitan tests, you right. know? Right. You know, is your, <laughs> is your relationship great? Or, but right. it's really sort of, it really kind of boils it down to what people can do on that first visit in a crisis. You know, it really takes it much less subject, in a much less subjective way and really creates some tangible things. So are there unregistered weapons? Are there registered weapons? Has the abuser ever hit the pets? Um, are there kids involved? You know, so they, they look at some very specific um, things that are happening, you know, evidence, but also dynamics of the abuse. And if they fall into that category of high risk, that team really looks and really does case management as it's progressing through the courts on that particular case. So some of the things they can do one thing is to make sure that the probate court people and the criminal court people are in communication with each other. So you don't have a probate court decision that provides unsupervised visitation mm -hmm. to an abuser who, you know, is going through the criminal court for, you know, violation of a restraining order for hitting his kids. You know, and without that coordination, you could have the two systems kind of operate independently of each other and, um, and create conflicting, you know, conflicting rulings, and then you know the non-abusive parent, very often the mother, ends up being either, you know, having to release their kid to this unsupervised visitation or being held in contempt of court for not doing so. 
And so we're trying to, through this high risk team, they're really trying to coordinate a lot of that and really prevent, you know, communities that have developed these and really run them for a couple of years are actually showing decreased homicide rates. So it's one tangible thing that we can, that we can do and really strengthen and, and support in our community that, um, that has the potential to decrease the homicide and incentive homicide rates. So, so those are some of the things that at the advanced, you know, kind of people think of like, you know, trying to improve dynamics and you know, relationships and create healthy relationships, but we're also dealing with these cases where some of us sometimes go home at night wondering if tonight's the night that we're going to get that phone call, you know. So it's uh, the whole continuum busy, still. Busy. Yes, busy, busy. <laughs> so. Like when you hire staff, you must do an intense quarry check. We do do a quarry check, um, yeah, for sure, and a background check of, you know, sort of, you know, the references that they provide, but also a check at their right. former workplaces. Especially for children. It's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. For, for our funding sources, there's certain checks and um, mm -hmm. that people have to, you know, have to agree to in order to, uh, to advance in the process. Well, if there's anything that we could ever do to help you, please let us know. Okay. I mean, Bill is really great for fundraising. One of these days. She was great for fundraising. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding you. Every every 501c3 that's come through here, she signed me up to be their fundraiser. I know. I know. I know. He's so good. I know how he does it. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's his, his voice. Right. And in his heart. heart. No. I, I you know. know. It is. It's, 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 it is hard. It's very sweet to say. I, and I, it's like anything with low-income families and affordable mm -hmm. housing and that, he's the same right. path I am. Well, you know, and you do anything you can to try to reach out to help. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, a couple of things that come to mind specifically that a city council or committee can do is help, um, help develop and build policies that the schools can use for dealing and handling disclosures, for dealing with, you know, I mean, how, how a school deals with bullying that needs to be connected to how it deals with, you know, observing domestic, you know, dating violence. I so think they whole, have that, don't they? For right. Well, they, they do in some other, I mean, actually, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of these things are threatened with um, funding cuts. Right. Know, there's, there's a litany here. Mm -hmm. um, Rosa Hill? You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I mean, and... You know, and I'm the liaison for the Northampton Youth Commission. Right. That'd mm -hmm. actually be a good point of access as well. Yeah, right. But institu uh, instituting um, programs, you know, um, talking about what it means to be a bystander. On, mm -hmm. on, I mean, right. they're focusing on bullying issues, but right. that, that, that may are the logical. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all part exactly. Of the and that's, yeah. I, I think, to expand mm -hmm. that conversation beyond just you know, school bullying to right. to mm -hmm. the way we conduct ourselves within the culture. Right. And I think, mm -hmm. right. and, you know, focusing leadership programs for um, sports, for instance, mm -hmm. where sports right. culture tends yeah. to promote mm -hmm. or at least accommodate um, uh, behaviors that uh, we would probably condemn in any other, uh, right. uh, any mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. strata. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so a lot of work to just to kind of just unpack all of that and yeah. kind of figure, figure that out. You know, there's, there's some interesting research that kind of talks about, you know, if bullying at, you know, grades six or seven goes, help, not, you know, but unchecked, mm -hmm. then grades nine, ten, it can be sexual harassment in the hallways. Right. Mm -hmm. And then college and beyond, it can become domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So, so, so some Something that, that that happens at that early level, a message, a communication, being held accountable, you know, can make all the difference in that person sort of developing those. It's not, it's not it, developing the attitudes, but also being having that be allowed to continue and even be rewarded. You know, have you talked with Marissa at all? At all? Um, I know that that Anthea, who, who you mentioned, and mm -hmm. our children's advocate um, are in contact with her. And they're working and, with her on these issues? Um, yes, yeah, they're, okay. they're okay. working okay. out you know, with so the, don't have so to worry about that. And then another thing that occurs to me is, you know, the city, you know, is many things. The city is also an employer. So a lot of the work around, you know, there, there's a whole movement or network now of employers against domestic violence, where which actually look at their own 
um, policies, incorporating domestic violence policies into personnel policies, mm -hmm. into union negotiations, mm -hmm. all of those things that we could probably have a further conversation about. There's some model mm -hmm. policies out there um, that, that sort of help, you know, help think through responses before there's a national crisis. Right. You know, so if you can imagine someone comes to work, you know, in City Hall tomorrow with a new restraining order that they got mm -hmm. today, right. would their supervisor, would they know how to handle that? It's an open building. Right. Um, you can't cut off a, an open public building. At the same time, someone who works there has a restraining order. How, do, how can you handle that? Who do you have to notify? Um, so thinking through those things in advance is right. somewhat more effective. Agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last year we ran into an incident, and I don't want to go into details with it, but we had talked with a director, about three of us on the Committee on Disabilities, about the all the directors get together and through human resource that we have an educational program, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that will teach employees how to handle people with disabilities. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. And we're working on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Linda Stoddard is the uh, head of HR. Mm -hmm. um, that would be actually a good connection to develop on that. I, and I, I, I don't imagine, I think that this would be a great collaboration for the city to, to get involved in. Mm -hmm. It could be maybe even lead by example, go yeah. figure. But yeah, yeah, that would be, yeah, yeah. that would be yes. terrific. And that's what's happened in, in some communities. There are larger companies and places really that have put those things in place. And they find that it's really the, the you know, whether it's a for-profit, you know, a company or store, you know, it, it really does help their bottom line. But then, you know, with a, a municipal government or a nonprofit, just the um, just the greater security and the um, well, that's a, the greater security, the right thing to do. But you know, it's the right thing, thing to do, to do it, and it's it's also the issue of enculturation, establishing right. culture mm -hmm. that, and again, walking the walk and talking the talk. Right. We're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, support these programs by um, excusing ourselves from actually participating mm -hmm. or allowing ourselves the distance right. to distance the same. That's not me. And I mean, that's the mm -hmm. part of the problem. I imagine it's part of the frustration that you experience is that people say, well, that's not me, that's somebody else. Mm -hmm. And allowing themselves that distance. Right. Well, pushing. and who doesn't want distance from this reality, too? I, you know, I understand, so the, totally I, understand, I, I understand the impulse and I understand yeah. And, and I understand mm -hmm. the resistance. At the mm -hmm. same time, yeah. I think mm -hmm. there's ways of doing this so that it's not a collective shame. It's just a collective right. work towards trying to be right. better. Right. Which, which, and do something that I think we can all agree is right. pretty horrible. Right. So, mm -hmm. and has certainly has horrible and deleterious consequences on the community. Right. So, so. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So. yeah. We're down. Okay. So, so <laughs> um, I love it. Give you. I know. And yeah, my so my card is. Um, your card's I got yours here. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, I do really appreciate this this opportunity to uh, yeah. Thank to you. talk with you about this and um, certainly going forward. There's yes. There's I want to thank you, have, um, thank you very very much well, for thank you. being here, and you'll be invited back. Great. Thank you. All right. Here's a beat up version of uh, my work card. Pet Keller. Okay. Pet Keller has her card too. Okay. <laughs> you got a, I think you got my card. I do. Okay. Yeah, really, really. Great. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you. Maria, do you have an extra one of these folders? Because Peg has got one. Yes, I'll, I'll give you the one that I was referring to. Hey, Peg, you okay. do me a favor? Yeah. Well, Mary. Along with my other stuff? Yep. This goes with. For Mary. Thank, okay. you, Mary Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Mary Ann, yep, very so much. much. Okay, there's, um, we'll open it up to the public, and there's no public comment. Um, I think our next will be for me to speak about our agenda for the month of June, which is by Peg, yeah. which is a heavy one. Uh, Mary Claire Higgins, she'll be coming in. And? Yep, she's going to do an overview of last year's community Great. action activities. Okay. And she's going to talk about how many fuel and weatherization clients live in Northampton. And also an update on the federal sequester and how those cuts will affect community action. Oh, the sequestering? Yes. We talked about that, uh, tax money. 
Yep, and then at 5.45 p.m. we have Pat Keller coming in, David Pomerite's coming in, and they'll be giving an update on the physical improvements of the Grove Street Inn, painting bid for the exterior, which we know right. yep. where that is coming for, from, and the porch reconstruction and the kitchen improvement completion. Then we have Susan Stubbs, who also is president and CEO of ServiceNet, Danielle Berry, Director of Emergency Shelters for ServiceNet, and Ann White, um, who will be coming in, and they'll be giving some quick updates. Okay, wow, okay. That's for June. That's for June. Yep, I got our schedule made up until like December. Oi, all right, <laughs> okay. So uh, I move that we adjourn. And I second that.